Good morning. It has been a good weekend. It's been a uh, very enjoyable to get to, to spend time with all of you, to get to, to meet more uh, members of the Lord's Church. We've been talking about discipleship and a lot of the things that, uh, that are related to that, a lot of the different aspects of discipleship and qualities of disciples. And this morning, we're going to continue on with that. And as we think about discipleship, particularly, uh, one thing we're going to talk about uh, in, in this session is something we talk about a lot in our society. The concept of love, well, in our country is big business. We spend a lot of money to express affection, to express love. Valentine's Day, for example, is the fifth largest consumer spending event in the United States annually. In 2022, it was estimated that around $23.9 billion was spent for people to express love and affection. But, you know, we think about that's, you know, we've, we've turned it into this just big expensive event, but, you know, we think about spending that kind of money to, to express love or spending something or expending value like that to express love, well, it's also something we see in the Bible. We're going to start off this morning in 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll see where in the interest of expressing love... Our God, our Savior Jesus Christ, spent immeasurably more than we can imagine, than we can fathom, to express His love for us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 17, it says, If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during your time of stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. And so God has spent immeasurably more than we can even fathom in order to express his love for his people. We've talked about over the last couple of days how the wages of sin is death. Well, that's exactly what Jesus paid. There was no price too high. There was nothing that was too big. He said, I'll pay it. And as the Hebrew writer says, there's no forgiveness without blood. So Jesus gave it. And when we look at this concept of disciples are those who love, you know, we've talked about how discipleship deals with imitating someone, uh, learning how to walk in their steps, following after their example. And so it's only fitting that as we're looking at this right now, we're talking about the love that our God shows, the love that our Savior has shown, because that's what we're trying to imitate. And we'll talk about what that looks like for us in just a moment, but I want to spend just another minute looking at who our God is. And in 1 John chapter 4... I want to look at a couple of passages there, and this kind of sets the stage for us to talk about then our part and how we express love as a disciple of our Lord and what that, what that means. But in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, John writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God for God is love. And then further on in verses 15 and 16 of the same chapter, it says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. And so twice there in this chapter, it uses that phrase, God is love. Over in chapter 1, John said, God is light. And what we see, are, these, are, these are phrases, these are concepts that define the nature of, the character of God. It doesn't just say that God shows love or God does loving things. Now, we look through Scripture and we see that's absolutely true, but this goes beyond that. It doesn't say that God shows love. It says that God is love. It defines His nature. It defines who He is. Everything that comes from God is an expression of love because it defines His nature. The greatest two commands, and we'll talk about these as we work our way a little bit later in the lesson, but they're all about love. Everything God does is loving. The pinnacle of, 
uh, of that is what he's done in sending Jesus into the world. In John 3, 16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God so loved that he expressed it in, a, in an incredible generosity. 1 John 3, 16 we know love by this. It tells us the, the action. It tells us what defines love for us. We know love by this. How do we know what real love is? How do we know what true love is? First John 3 tells us, He laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. How we know what true love really means over and against what our, our world says true love is sometimes. Well, to our society, love is this feeling. It's an emotion. You can fall into it. You can fall out of it. It may last a little while. It may last a lifetime. We don't know. That's not scriptural love. That word agape that is translated as love is one that is a decision. And sometimes it's something that we are to do in spite of how we feel. We make a decision to show love. We know love by this. We know what real love is because Jesus went to the cross and so whenever we're talking about discipleship, we're talking about disciples being those who love, it's in following in the footsteps of our God and of our Savior who have defined what love is, who have shown us what love is. We wouldn't know what real love is outside of the actions of Jesus Christ. And so if we're to be followers of Jesus, we have to be people who are characterized by our love. And so I want to look at a few aspects of that. And the first one I mentioned, um, the greatest commands. If you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. In this context, Jesus was being questioned about the greatest command in the law. Matthew 22, and I know the, the PowerPoint there says, beginning in verse 37, for the sake of context, I'm going to back up to verse 34. It says, When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. If we're to be disciples of Jesus Christ, the first thing we have to do as far as loving is love our Lord. And we talked the other day about our obedience shows that we love Him. The way that we respond to His commands. But love for Him is what God has always wanted. Jesus is quoting there from Deuteronomy chapter 6. What God has always wanted is for His people to love Him with all that they are and all that they have. And that's what He wants from you and me today, for us to love Him with everything that we are. Nothing is held back. The greatest command in the law is to love the Lord with the heart, the soul, the mind, and the strength. It takes effort that encompasses everything about us. If we really love God, there's no part of our lives that will be untouched or unchanged by Him. This is exactly the kind of thing that we observe in Jesus. A love for the Father to the fullest, to the greatest extent. That He was willing to go through with His mission. He was willing to carry out the will of the Father, no matter what it meant. You remember His prayer in the garden. Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. As Jesus is there looking forward to, understanding and anticipating what He's getting ready to go through, He says, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He was willing to do whatever it took. And that's exactly what He calls us to do. Do whatever it takes. John 14 and verse 15 that we talked about in an earlier session. Jesus said, if you love Me, you'll keep My commandments. Disciples are those who love the Lord first and foremost. We love Him. We want to be like Him and we'll choose to follow after Him. But how does that look? What does it look like in our lives from day to day? If we're going to follow after the love of Jesus, and if we're going to love the Lord, one of the essential manifestations of that, one of the essential ways that we will carry that out 
is not just in saying, oh, I love the Lord. But it deals with how we treat the people around us. Because if we continue that passage in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus didn't stop there with the greatest command, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. In verse 39, He said the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. The second command is tied inseparably to loving God. He said this is like it. The second is just like it. And he said this is, this is what the whole law and the prophets rest on, what God has always been looking for, that you love the Lord and you love others. The, all the rest of it rests on this. If you love God, what are you going to do? Obey Him. If you love your neighbor as yourself, Paul would say, love does no harm. And so those Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because you see, when we choose to love our neighbor as ourselves, we're not going to do those sorts of things. All of those things come back to that command. And he quotes here from Leviticus chapter 19, love your neighbor as yourself. Turn a couple of chapters with me, if you will, over to Matthew 25. And we see how the way that we treat one another is tied to uh, our relationship with God. In Matthew 25, I'll begin reading in verse 34. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer to them and say, Truly I say to you that to the extent you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. You see, the way that we express our love to God is by expressing our love to His people. Those that He died for. Those that He loves. Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? And he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. How we treat one another, how we treat the people around us is tied inseparably to our relationship to God, to our Lord. He says, if you are taking care of my people, he says, you're taking care of me. You remember when Saul was on the road to Damascus whenever he was encountered by that light, encountered by the resurrected Jesus, what did he ask him? He said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, let me think. Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was, he was after the church. Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Because to persecute his church was to persecute him. When we show love to the people of God, we're showing love to God. But the other side of that, whenever we neglect the people of God, we're neglecting God. If we want to show love to our God, we have to show love to one another. Paul speaks to this same concept over in Romans 13, and I alluded to this just a moment ago, but I want us to take a look at it. Um, just for, if for nothing else, just so that we can we put our eyes on the text where it says this in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10.
You know, this is in the, the practical section of the book of Romans where in the first 11 chapters, Paul has been building this case for why we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ, not by our own works, not by earning it, not by doing enough, being good enough, but that we're justified by faith in Jesus when we obediently trust in Him. Then we're saved. Our sins are taken away. And in chapters 12 and following, Paul talks about, okay, what are the implications this has for how we live from day to day? And he says in Romans 13, beginning in verse 8, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. That sounds a lot like what Jesus said over in Matthew 22. What are the greatest commands? Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two depend the whole law and prophets. Paul here says, he who loves has fulfilled the law. Here's what God has always been after. When we love God, we obey Him. When we love His people, we're going to be good to them. These other commands, they're going to fall into place. It's going to make sense. Love has fulfilled... Uh, he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this... You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. If there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. What God has always been after is that we'll love Him enough to do what He says. Trust Him enough to do what He says. And treat one another the way we would want to be treated. Speaking at a very basic level, that's what God has always been after from His people. You look at the nation of Israel, what's He want? Be good to each other. Tell the nations around who I am. And express your love to him through obedience. The heart behind all of the commands is love. If I love my neighbor, I don't want to hurt him. If I love my God, I'm going to want to serve him. I'm going to want to obey him. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now he continues on, or we're going to continue on and look at another aspect of, of discipleship as far as showing love, because we've seen love, that we're to love God, we're to love our neighbors. But we're going to get a little bit more specific in this next one in talking about loving other people, and specifically what we see in Scripture is we see where the Bible talks about how we are to love the brethren. We can't love Jesus if we don't love the people that are in covenant with Him. If we don't love the people that are His. I want to ask you to open up to 1 John chapter 4. I'll begin reading in just a moment in verse 19. And this is another one of those passages that will hit you hard when you really start thinking about the implications of it. But if you remember, John is in this letter, he's dealing with some false teaching that's been going on. Um, and he, there's that saying, and I talked about this the other day, that saying where, where John say, if we say or if someone says, and he's about to expose the false teachers. Those who thought they had some superior knowledge and a better connection to God. And notice here in 1 John 4, he said, We love because he first loved us. If someone says, okay, here it comes, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Those two things are incompatible. Those two things don't go together. If someone says, I love God, but he's not treating the people of God with love, something's wrong. Those two things don't go hand in hand. It says, He's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. But there in verse 20, 
He who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. If we don't love one another, what John is telling us there by inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that if I don't love you, it is impossible for me to love God. It doesn't say that if we don't love one another that it's going to be difficult to love God. He's saying that a lack of love among the people of God is incompatible with love between us and God. If we love Him, by extension, we also love one another. Now we've been talking about, and I mentioned, uh, I've mentioned before um, about how this, this idea of love, agape, it is a love of decision. Sometimes that choosing to love means I'm choosing to love in spite of how I feel, but if I love God, I'm going to choose, even on days when I don't feel like it, to love His people. That's a decision that we make. Like the decision that He made. The identifying mark of love is action. We know love by this that He laid down His life for us. But in John chapter 13, why is this so important? Why is this so essential? In John 13, 34, and 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the identifying mark of followers of Jesus. You want people to know that you love, that you follow after Jesus. Demonstrate love for his people. Now, I know today we get caught up in this, well, if, if I'm going to follow after Jesus, I have to be clever. I have to know all of these things. I have to, well, and unfortunately in our world today, we see if I follow after Jesus, some, some people say, well, I have to, it's, it's essential that I vote a certain way. Jesus never said that. They'll know you're my disciples, not by how clever you are, how good you are at winning arguments with people who have maybe a lack of understanding in something. They'll know you're my disciples not by how you vote or what you look like or what kind of car you drive. By this, by your love for one another, the world will know that you're my disciples, Jesus said. And he clarifies specifically what that means. Love one another as I have loved you. Now we know that this is just before he's getting ready to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane where he's going to be arrested. But he talks about there as I have loved you in the immediate context. He's just finished washing their feet. He made the decision to serve all the way through, he had been humbling. All the way through his ministry, he has humbled himself to serve his people, to look out for what's best to teach them. But he's shown them love by putting them first, and he's getting ready to do that in the most incredible way possible. It's impossible for us to love God if we don't love one another, if we don't choose to love one another. And that's how the world will know that we actually follow Jesus as well. But the expression of this kind of love, what does that look like practically? Okay, I know the command's there. I've got to love my brother. I've got to choose to love my brother. What does that look like? Well, as you work your way through the New Testament, you'll find that there are quite a few passages that tell us specifically how to treat one another. You want to know what it looks like love demonstrated between one another? Go through and find all of those one another passages about where the Bible tells you how to treat one another. Love that's commanded is love that's a choice. It's not just an emotion because sometimes we don't feel like being loving. The expression of love comes out of a decision of how we love or how we treat one another. For example, in Romans chapter 15 and verse 7, Paul says, therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Well, you know, sometimes 
brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so over here, well, they're just kind of irritating me. I don't really want to accept them. Accept one another as Christ has accepted you. How has Christ accepted you and how has Christ accepted me? He accepted me in all of my stubbornness. He accepted me whenever I was unlovable. Accepted me when I was in rebellion to Him. Accepted me, not because I was deserving of it, but because of how good He is. Accept one another as Christ has accepted you. This kind of love draws people to Christ. When the world sees people of different races and politics and nationalities, of different generations, all accepting and being good to each other, that gets attention because you don't see that in a lot of places out there. You see division and anger and frustration. God says, accept one another. James chapter 5, verses 14 to 18, pray for one another. Why? Because God hears and answers. It's the best thing that we can do for each other is to bring each other's names up before the throne of God. Specifically, Hebrews 3, 12 and 13, encourage one another. Because we all need it sometimes. You know, there's a saying going around that there's pain in every pew. Every one of us is fighting some battle, dealing with some struggle that others don't know about. Do you come looking for a way to encourage your brothers and sisters? That's one of the best ways that we can express love to each other is to build each other up. Find a kind word that you can say that will help someone to leave motivated, help someone to leave encouraged. Encouragement can help people to rely more on God and to stand firm in trusting Him. There's a passage that also, the next one up there is in 2 Chronicles 32, and this is not one of the specific one another passages, but it goes along with encouragement. In 2 Chronicles 32, we see the effect that encouragement can have. Because this is as Hezekiah was king over Judah. And we know that the, the Assyrians took the northern tribes. They didn't take the kingdom of Judah, but they almost took Judah. And this is when Sennacherib had invaded the southern tribes as well. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, we have the response of Hezekiah to the, to the threats and the things that, Sennach that Sennacherib of the Assyrians was, uh, was sending to him. 2 Chronicles 32 As Sennacherib has invaded Judah and he's threatening to take over the southern tribes as well, it says in verse 6, speaking of Hezekiah, he appointed military officers over the people and gathered them to him in the square at the city gate and spoke encouragingly to them, saying, Be strong and courageous and do not fear or be dismayed because of the king of Assyria, nor because of all the horde that is with him. For the one with us is greater than the one with him. With him is only an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people relied on the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Because of Hezekiah's encouragement, the people of Judah relied on God. And who knows whether or not your words of encouragement could cause a brother or sister who is just on the verge of giving up to keep going. One of the best ways that we can express love and show our love to one another is by encouraging each other. Paul told the Galatians to bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 1 and 2. You know, if anybody in the church, anybody around that has a burden they're struggling to bear, maybe some kind of a physical burden, a financial burden, something that's overcome them, a hardship they're facing, maybe it's an emotional burden because of a relationship that they're struggling in, or maybe a spiritual burden that their faith has been attacked. Do we stand ready to bear those burdens in whatever way is appropriate? Ephesians 4.32 says, Forgive one another as God and Christ has forgiven you, so also should you. When we choose to forgive one another, that says that we love one another. 
It says, I am choosing to put this relationship over maybe my hurt feelings. Because, you know, sometimes whenever things go wrong, it takes a long time for the emotion or the hurt to go away. Forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. It's a decision we make regardless of emotion. And it's a way that we choose to show our love to each other, sometimes in spite of how we feel. If we follow after Jesus, we're going to first and foremost love God. We're going to love the people around us, love our neighbor as ourself. Getting a little more specific, we are going to love one another within the church because you can't love God if you don't love his people. And finally, what I think is one of the more difficult commands in Scripture, he says, love your enemies. We see he gives that command in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who use you. But in Romans chapter 5, we have the perfect demonstration of that love. Specifically in what Jesus has done. In Romans 5, beginning in verse 6, he says, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die, but God. I always love whenever those two words show up together in Scripture. But God. Here's what man might would do. And I hear Paul is saying, now let me tell you what God did. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us while we were in rebellion, while we weren't showing our love, while we weren't even attempting probably to be good enough. God, through Christ, paid the highest possible price. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. While we were enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies. You know, when we look at the commands, specifically as we consider the difficult commands that we have from our Lord in Scripture, what you find over and over and over again is that Christ doesn't command us to do anything that He hasn't already done Himself. He sets the example. He doesn't give us these difficult things that we find you know, hard to do. How am I going to find the ability to do this? Look at the example of Christ. Love your enemies. Christ has already done it in the way that He loved me. He loves in spite of our sinfulness. While we were His enemies, He loved us anyway. When we rebel, He loves us anyway. When we betray Him in sin, He loves us anyway. And He paid the highest price to pay for our sin. If we're to follow Jesus, we have to get past wanting vengeance on others. We have to get past this idea of when somebody hits me, I'm going to hit them back. Somebody insults me, I'm going to insult them back, and then I'm going to insult their family too for good measure. Well, that's what the world wants. That's not the way of Jesus. That's not the way of a disciple. In Romans 12, 17 to 21, Paul writes, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Our job is to be good. The charge that God gives us is to be good to people no matter how they've been to us. Because ultimately that's how we make an impact for Jesus in the world. When we live differently than the people out there, when we resist the urge 
to do what would come naturally. And we choose to love anyway. That's how we're going to make an impact on this world. That's how we're going to be the light of the world that God calls us to be. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 6, and we'll close with this passage because we're getting close to being out of time, but in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 12, and this is one we talked about a little bit earlier this weekend. Paul in this context is talking about the spiritual war that we're in. And he says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of the wickedness in the heavenly places. In other words, lost people are not our enemy. Jesus says, love your enemies and do good to them. Pray for them. Why? Because although we might identify them as enemies, when we take a look at the big picture of the spiritual war we're in, that's our mission objective. Because that person that we consider an enemy, that person that, we're, that we may be in competition with for a promotion at work, that person that frustrates us, that neighbor that we can't seem to get along with, or even that person, if we're looking at it nationally or politically, on the other side of the world that our politicians may say, we're supposed to, we're supposed to hate them. Those are people that Jesus died for. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. For God so loved the world... God so loved the world of sinful, rebellious people. God so loved the world of people that didn't love Him. God so loved the world of people who were against Him. God so loved the world of people who chose to crucify His Son. God so loved you and me that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God so loved, and He charges us to love in that same way. To love Him, and to love everyone around us, whether it's easy or not. It's a decision that we make. And if we are to follow after Jesus, if we are going to be His disciples, we have to make a decision that we're going to love those around us at every opportunity we have. I think we've got just about two or three minutes left uh, of our time. That's the uh, end of the material that I have, but if there are any comments or questions or discussion, I don't know if that's something you typically do in class. Uh, If not, we can... I'm sorry? Okay. <laughs> oh. It's in the back room. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, if we need to go back there, we can discuss the material. And uh, <laughs> uh, well, if there if there are no uh, any no comments or, or questions or anything, we'll we'll go ahead and conclude at that point and. Uh, but I appreciate everyone's attention and, and attendance and look forward to, to wrapping up the series on discipleship in our next session.